So the, the, uh, the final presentation of the day, it's, it is the final presentation, but there is a, um, a panel discussion following it. The final presentation of the day is exhibition copies for film works. And the presenter is Janice E. Allen, AKA John E. Allen II. Uh, is leading John E, AKA John E. I should read it the way it was written instead of trying to improvise. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Janice E. Allen, AKA John E. Allen II, is a leading expert in film preservation and head of the John E. Allen family of companies. Not many can say they were born and raised next to a nitrate vault, splicing nitrate film when they were five years old. In its third generation, the business began in 1904 with her grandfather's professional photography studio in Rochester, New York. Her father, John E. Allen, started business in the mid-1930s in Rochester. This business evolved into a motion picture stock footage archive and a film preservation laboratory preserving nitrate-based films starting in the 1950s. The laboratory functioned in conjunction with the, archive, with the archive, providing stock footage elements for producers as well as preservation elements for uh, outside archives. Janice has been a principal in the company full-time since 1970 and greatly expanded the business in the 1980s, including a specialized optical film facility called Cinema Services. The preservation facility is currently known as Cinema, Cinema Arts and is world renowned for the care and quality in the preservation services they provide for museums, archives, and filmmakers worldwide. Now, please Janice, come. Yep, I've been told that, and you can confirm it, that you're gonna be showing film, and the lights are gonna be really low, very dark, but that you also wanna take some questions during the... It's loud. It's loud? It's allowed. It's allowed, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it's permitted, to just shout out questions. And, uh, and don't try to make your way to the microphone because it'll be really dark and that might not work. Or get near it if, you know. Or maybe you can get near it. Or know. you can yell. Yeah. Just yell. Yeah, scream. I don't know. Scream at me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's all yours. OK. Here's your thing. OK. Good. That's it. Left and right. OK, but we want to go off now. So how do I start? Just get it. Okay. This one's the view. That's what? On view. On? Yeah. Oh, OK. Great. OK. Hello. Um, we're talking about two films today. Uh, one of them is a film by Agnes Martin. What? No, I'm not on the mic. Um, and this was a uh, cooperative effort between the Museum of Modern Art and the Pace Gallery uh, for exhibition copies and preservation elements. And um, we were initially uh, presented with two elements is all that was available. Uh, there was a faded Eastman Kodak color print from the 70s. This film originated in 1976. And that was completely red. There was nothing much left of the image. And the other element was a Kodachrome print uh, known as 7387. That was a print stock that was specifically designed for uh, making prints from ECO, which was Kodak's film known as Ektachrome commercial film. And uh, that was what the camera original was, but we didn't know that at the time uh, because all we had was two prints. And the Kodachromes tend to be rather high contrast and very difficult to duplicate well. Uh, plus, it, they, these were just used prints. They were projection prints that had been uh, around for all those years since 1976. So I wasn't too happy about this. This was a, a pretty important film. It, it was Agnes's uh, first and only film. And uh, uh, it's 78 minutes long. So we got the elements, these two prints in, and, and started taking a, a real close look at it. Uh, we uh, always try to come from the best element. 
outside. It's, it's getting really reverberant. Okay, is, it, is this turning up too high or something? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so they just turn it up? Yeah. Okay. S Hello. Hello? Is that better? Could you hear me before? I was just starting to feedback, you know. Okay. So I wasn't too happy about all this, but, you know, we work with what exists and, and what is handed to us typically, but sometimes we try to go beyond that. And in this case, you know, to us, a, a film from 1976 is a pretty late film. Uh, you know, we're used to doing films from 1910, you know, so that's an old film to us. Uh, a new film, 1976 is a new film. And we, uh, we started scrutinizing the print, and there were clues on, or the both prints actually, there were clues on the print that indicated who the original lab was that had done the work. Uh, and they had made inner negs as well as reversal prints directly from the original uh, reversal. ECO, uh, as a side note, is a low con somewhat low contrast camera material, mainly used for duplication. It's about 15% lower contrast than, than normal projection contrast. So there were clues on the prints of who had done the original work. And I said to the, the, the powers that be that perhaps we should try and see if the lab still had the original elements after all these years. And we started an investigation and sure enough, everything existed. All the original magnetic soundtracks, uh, the original uh, cut rolls, I think it existed in, in eight rolls for a 68 minute film. I believe that it was cut into small rolls because either they made a blow up originally or uh, they were going to. I, I don't know that they ever did uh, because there's no, we never saw any 35 millimeter elements. So we started the, the process of getting those originals uh, in house so we could check them out and see if uh, they were also faded badly and the picture elements were not and the magnetic tracks were not, they, everything was acetate, you know, no, nothing was really uh, acetic. Um, so we were looking pretty good and the, the, uh, the dyes were quite decent on the original. Uh, the, the other good news was that Kodak still made the exact film that was, was recalled for to make negatives from ECO, uh, which was 30, well, originally 7272. Um, we chose a um, polyester version, a star version of that, which is known as uh, 3272, or was known as, I should say. And uh, that's what we made the negatives on. And, and the plan was to make a preservation negative to be put away in MoMA's vaults for long term. You know, they have a wonderful uh, uh, storage facility, state of the art, uh, so the film would be protected. Uh, in the end, they ended up with all of the originals, which also went into their high end vaults. And uh, Pace retained a negative for making prints. And um, it, it worked out really well. Um, we made some digital viewing copies and uh, uh, Pace is planning on selling the film to archives that want to buy it. Um, so anyhow, I think we're gonna start running and if you put the lights down. Uh, we may turn the sound and turn the, the spot off. Um, and again, if anyone has, wants to yell out and ask questions, be my guest. Got a little, could you frame a little on that? Well, <laughs> since this was Agnes's first film, she wasn't real savvy on, on technology uh, of motion picture 
And that's as focused as that shot's going to be. Uh, you'll see it's going to improve. Uh, she had issues with... You, you can kill the sound for a little bit. Uh, she had problems with fo uh, zooming and focus. Uh, she apparently didn't know that you need to zoom all the way in and focus, and then you can zoom and everything will stay in focus. That's a common, common error. Um, you can turn the sound on for a little bit. You may notice some wow in the sound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Do you, when you come across mag elements, uh, are there any rules of thumb about whether they're mixed or not, or how you can determine if the sound is listening to it or trusting the lab? Um, well, usually if it's a single track mag and, that, and it's all there is, you know, if it's Sometimes it'll be marked a mixed mag. Maybe, Mar Maurice, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I mean, certainly in the 16, I mean, the majority of, majority of, uh, of audio is on single, single stripe mag. That was the most common. Uh, I mean, it was basically meant to be mono. Audio is directed from mono off of the track. Uh, they have introduced, there is um, um, two stripe mag, the 16, but that's, again, they didn't use it for that. But remember, we also had the existing prints that were made in 76, so we knew these long sections of quiet were existed, and we knew that the, the wow was in the original version. You know, So in a 35 millimeter film, that's a whole different issue. You can end up with uh, three tracks, four tracks, six track mags, you know, and uh, that would then have to be mixed down you know, to a mixed mag if, if you didn't have the mixed mag. The mag protection element only if you have original mag elements. You don't make a mag protection element of the album. We often do, yeah. And, and we typically, you know, 35 mag is an, a very robust medium. It's it's easy. It it it's it's proven. Um, it takes up a little more space than a digital file, but it's on a piece of film, and uh, it doesn't take uh, too much effort to come up with equipment to play it back even even if it didn't exist you know you could build a machine to play it you know without too much trouble I don't know and and I don't think Kodak could even tell you about this anymore because from what I understand they've they've destroyed a lot of records <laughs> over the years uh, you know. yeah well but usually the that was for focused issues wasn't it mainly yeah. yeah I mean you know there were recommendations particularly for acetate uh, there was a period of time where they were trying to get particularly 35 millimeter acetate prints in, it typically are wound emulsion out f for use. And, and so they're that way, well, uh, but a lot of projectors take it up base out. So when it's tails up, it's base out. Okay, but I think it was SMPT came up with the point that if you 
wound an acetate print base out, and if you could get all of the projectors to run the base out, and none of the projectors were set up really to run a base out, and a lot of them would just scratch the film. So, but they found that the focus would hold better if the prints were um, on, on screen, if the prints were wound uh, base out but it just never came to be. You know, this is a whole different issue. You know, we're, we're talking about actual deterioration of the image because, uh, you know, of it being wound emulsion out, you know, which is just really strange. But I, I can't explain what it's about. Uh, it was something that Kodak uh, claimed. But again, I, I think because of a lot of the litigious things that are going on, you know, over the past decades, uh, Kodak has, has, has gotten rid of a lot of records. And so, you know, we'll have a problem with a film, for instance, and uh, we've had the problem 20 years ago, and we had the problem 30 years ago, and it comes and goes, and, and it used to be they could track what was wrong based on what happened before. And, and now, you know, it's like starting at square one every time there's a problem, you know, that, that happened decades ago because they don't have records anymore, you know, or the people are all gone, you know. Um, but, you know, in general, I, I mean, so far, you know, there's a lot of hysteria about uh, motion picture film uh, materials not being available. Um, ECO is, or, or 72, uh, uh, stock uh, 7272 and, and uh, 3272 has been our biggest casualty as far as a loss. Um, so far, uh, everything else is, is pretty good, and, and it's very simple. You know, uh, it's just like Kodachrome. They, they discontinued Kodachrome because nobody was buying it. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer, and it just not enough sales, and it's the same thing with 72 stock. Uh, it's, it was the most expensive duplicating stock that Kodak made, uh, and the economy crashed, and uh, nobody was doing any work, and, you know, I pleaded with them. You know, I said, look it, you know, it'll come back. You know, people are going to keep using this stuff, but, you know, you know, everyone knows the position Kodak's in, and they, they just have to do things that make sense. You know, when, when they were rolling in the in the dough, uh, you know, they could, they could afford to have a, a loss leader, you know, which is, th 72 has probably been a loss leader for many years. Um, a very useful stock uh, that we've, we've employed many times for many projects. So we use that stock for making uh, uh, color negatives of uh, Gr Griffiths films, you know, Intolerance and Birth of a Nation and multiple preservation 35 millimeter negatives because these were tinted, uh, his original tinted personal prints we were doing. And uh, it, it, it was a great stock for that. You know, a lot, a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but when there were a lot of opticals going on, people sometimes were using camera negative, which, which is a valid option, but uh, we didn't really see it being any better. Uh, we ran tests both ways, uh, any better at the time than, than the 72 product was. Um, and I'll get into the next show, which is the standard gauge. That, this is also a, a project we did on 72. Um, uh, however, it was entirely different because this film uh, was a high contrast projection original was what we were making negative from. Is there any other questions on Gabriel before I go on to the next one? Okay, so uh, this is standard gauge, and uh, these are original sheets that uh, were given to us in order to make this project happen. And uh, let me just see my notes a minute. This is a, it's a dual projection uh, installation uh, by Ricardo Valentum, and uh, it first, I think it, it screened, what, last, last month, Ricardo, in, in Spain? Uh, I was told it was a really large venue. How big was the screen? Big. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, what it's this this film? Uh, Ricardo had it in his his head how this was going to be, but it didn't really exist any other way. So he gave us some flow charts of how he wanted it to happen, and then we had to massage it and and kind of make sense out of it and and make it all happen. And uh, it's based around uh, existing uh, ethnographic classroom films for, for young students, uh, international origin, uh, from the 60s and the f 70s, uh, films that were shown to school children. And what was, the original we were working from was the original films that were run in classrooms. And so they were worn and broken and spliced and uh, some of them were very faded. Uh, I think, how many films is it? Six total? Uh, five? Well, f well, I mean, orig the original film? Yeah. We, 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 I have another. Yeah, let's see. But it's, it's six, six films. Right, right. So, so we, we started with six classroom films. Um, most of them were on Eastman color print from the 60s and 70s, and you might well imagine what they look like, and they, they, they were pretty faded. Uh, one of them, which is what we'll be projecting, uh, I picked the good one, of course, the best one. <laughs> it was on AGFA a print, which held up much better than uh, Kodak. And uh, they all had optical sound. Um, And they were scratched and beat up the way classroom films typically are. There were title cards, and that's, that's what this shows. The beginning, this is the, uh, the be this, it's, it's two complete shows that are screened side by side. And, and the way the shows happen is uh, one of the roles is, let's call it the C role. So this is the C role, and, and that's the, the common role. This is show one. So side by side, we're showing the A role, role one, with the C role, and that's one complete show. Then the other show is the B role, and the C role. So the one of the roles is common. And uh, this was a layout, a rough layout indicating uh, where the titles were, where the black was to be, because some of the films weren't the same length. They, they didn't match exactly. They, the, the white area is, is the length of the film. And you can see that they're all this one doesn't quite match this one, and, and you know they're all different. This one's way longer, so we had to slug out with black. So when 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 this one continued, this screen would go black, possibly, or or you'd go into the credits there with a little black section. Um, so it it all it had to sync, and uh, then these are the tail title cards. Um, this is a little more information when we started getting into actual lengths and how long the black would be and how long the total roll lengths would be. It ended up uh, about 1,673 feet there. Um, and we had to determine with Ricardo uh, how long the titles would run and, and uh, we changed the academy leaders, put new ones on. So, and what we did was we, we assembled master roles out of the original film. So his master is, is the film, the original 50s or 60s and 70s uh, prints along with the new titles that were generated. They were shot on a, a 35 uh, Oxbury stand. 
Um, actually, um, UCLA lab uh, made the uh, did the master of the the titles, and then we made reduction color negative uh, from those and integrated uh, made made positives and cut all this together into a 16 millimeter master in three rolls A B C. Um, then we made the first set of negative, and it was 3272. Um, Maurice Schechter at Duart re-recorded uh, all the sound uh, right from the original uh, optical uh, and made a, uh, the initial 16 millimeter uh, track negative. Um, and then we made prints. Uh, the, the beauty of this system is uh, Ricardo will likely need additional negatives to uh, sell to other institutions. Uh, and so with this system, we can make everyone exactly the same quality. Um, so no one's going to get a better exhibition than anyone else. Uh, these are just more more details as to the exact number of frames that each roll is made up of. And we can run the film now. And uh, you can put the sound on also. And there's no history. And, and the, the filmmaker's dead. Uh, and the lab people are gone that, that dealt with the issues. Uh, that's why it's really nice to, if at all possible, uh, to find the people along with the film that were involved, you know, so that you can actually hear the stories. And, and it's so common that, that people don't really do that. Uh, one of the restorations of Gone with the Wind, you know, they, they made prints maybe 20 years ago, one of the restorations they did. And, if you look at an original print of Gone with the Wind, a Technicolor print, it's, it looks golden. It has a, a golden cast over the whole film. And when they restored it, the, dis the studio's decision was to make it look normal, like normal color. It didn't look anything like the original. And I, that, to me, is not, it's, it's inconceivable. <laughs> but I guess they, you know, it's their film, uh, you know, they wanted, to market it, and they felt that it would be best marketed as 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 just standard color, you know. So, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, but you're only running two at a time. It's two films. It, it's two complete separate films that are dual projection. So A and C is one film. So you run A and C on two screens. Then you, then you run B and C on two screens. It's two completely separate shows. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That we should get into the panel discussion. Can you continue maybe some of this discussion in the panel? Is sure, right? sure, it's fine with me. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Wonderful. That was great. Thanks. It was great. So. <laughs>